Jackie. I'm Secretary General of Assess Singapore Cryptocurrency and Blockchain Industry Association. So today, our panel topic um, for today, the last one, is security and privacy, building a SAFU future. Um, so of course, for this um, SAFU topic itself, uh, a crypto mini made popular uh, by the uh, recent fiasco, probably an issue in early March last year, basically relating to an API and Syscoin attack, which saw the withdrawal of Bitcoin as well as the temporary shutdown of Binance. Um, so SAFU, in, in the right form for Binance, I would say that it uh, stands for Secure Asset Funds for Users. And um, with that issue, I think uh, there was also an announcement of pledging or allocating part of the trading fees into these funds to better protect their users. So um, it will be an exciting panel today, and with me, uh, it's an esteemed panel uh, of panelists um, to actually share with us about the industry uh, outlook relating to this point of privacy and security. So I have on my left um, Jeremy Lam from Omise Go, Dimitri from Hacken, Harry Halpin from NIM, and um, Toby from Fetch.ai. So we'll start with um, Harry. Harry itself um, is a chairman and designer of NIM, and it's a new project um, recently backed by Binance Labs uh, related to creating a privacy enhanced internet. He's also a research scientist at MIT and then in RIA in computer science, previously leading at um, W3C Web Crypto Working Group to standardize cryptographic APIs across all browsers and also led European Commission's first project on decentralization. So welcome, Harry. So I wanted to check with you, what are the current threats in security, privacy, in crypto trading and blockchain industry today and what do we need to watch out for? So, in my opinion, there is uh, everyone's very interested in attacks on, you know, 51% attacks and on blockchain privacy, on-chain privacy, such as that dealt by Zcash and Monero. But I think there's a huge attack and privacy threat that no one's thinking about, and that's attacks on what we call level zero, the peer-to-peer -peer broadcast traffic. So whenever you do a transaction, you, of course, broadcast that transaction to other peers in the network. And this is very easy to both attack via civil attacks because that traffic is unencrypted, unauthenticated. I think that holds for all major cryptocurrencies. But uh, even worse, we do know after the Snowden revelations that well-funded government agencies such as the NSA, but now even probably well-funded companies can simply record all that traffic and use the metadata and the timing of that traffic to de-anonymize and essentially either capture or reveal the identity of who's done every single transa transaction on any blockchain. So we've been working with Binance Lab at the NIM project to build a next generation mixed network with anonymous authentication credentials, which we think can solve that problem, but I'll be discussing that tomorrow. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Harry. Um, so, Jeremy, um, you know, sharing on from Harry's um, experience, any experience on security or privacy breaches um, that, and how you protect yourself from that, or a personal experience, or from what we say, go? Um, yeah, so from a personal experience, I guess, it just happened a couple of days ago. Um, I thought I'd have a look at have I been known, and I noticed that one of my older email addresses um, is listed 16 times in from different breaches. Um, so luckily I've been using a password manager for some time, so I haven't noticed. Noticed is an operating word, anything going wrong with my accounts. Um, but that's, that's happened really recently. Uh, maybe to make it a little bit more blockchain focused, um, something that has happened, I think just generally in the industry we need to think about is people losing funds, just so it's not really, say, an active attack, it's just how do we protect people from themselves? So an example of this, I, you know, I, I was pretty excited with the theory of um, some time ago. I bought 10 e which wasn't very much at the time, and I, and I created a guest wallet on a, on a um, VPS, and um, that disappeared. Um, and I came back sort of a year later and went, oh, okay, that's a shame. Um, but I, I think that's something that um, maybe many people like my father, for example, has experience, um, and that's something that is important to progress industry. Um, so, 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 to all the panelists here, so, what do you think are the changes required? Is it more from the regulation?
regulatory point of view or more from the self-regulation point of view or, or are we shifting more the responsibility towards individuals? Um, so Toby, would you like to take on that first? Yeah, regulation. Eh? Um, the thing about regulation is it always lags behind um, innovation and that's exactly the way it should be. If it ever catches up, then it acts as the sort of the glue in the, in the wheels of progress. Um, and one of the problems with, with regulation uh, is that it's very, very easy to get too carried away with it, particularly in an area right now where we're still innovating across all areas of it. And you do run the risk of shutting down some of the really amazing things that are taking place in this space. And actually, again, if you increase the amount of regulation, all you really do, rather than uh, potentially solving the problem, is shift all the work from one area to somewhere with, with less regulation, which is not really the desired outcome. One thing that we know, for example, the European Commission taking this very seriously uh, and, and looking and listening a lot, which is very, very helpful, uh, and, and listening to what they should do uh, in, in order to help them, talking to all the people who are actually innovating, because they're very anxious to avoid uh, regulating the innovation out of the system. Um, so regulation is a tough one, of course, what you can't do is regulate um, user safety and you said to protect users against themselves. Um, one of my colleagues who's a, a cryptographer says that uh, he blames cryptographers. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I um, blame all cryptographers, but for making something that's spectacularly human unfriendly. And when it comes to talking about wallets and things like that, we use all these words and terms which we think mean something, but the reality is to normal people, they just, they just don't. Uh, and we rely on the fact that um, if you lose the key to your house, you haven't just written your house off. You, know, you don't have to burn it to the ground and, and start again. You can go to a locksmith. Uh, and you can get another key. And this is one of the reasons why people leave um, their, their crypto assets uh, in exchanges, because exchanges act as a locksmith. Um, if, if they lose the private key, well, they didn't have it in the first place, so it's not an issue. Um, they can get it back. Whereas with great, greater privacy and greater control comes enormous responsibility. And we're expecting people to look after these private keys. If they lose them, you end up with these comical situations like this poor guy in the UK who had goodness knows how many um, Bitcoins he mined in the early days, and then he threw the hard drive out. Uh, and then when Bitcoin price went up, he uh, was rather sadly pictured uh, on the news in the newspapers, digging through a tip trying to find um, his hard drive, which he never found. Uh, and that's one of the reasons is we need to think about how to solve those kind of problems. And people are rubbish at this kind of stuff, even with, with, with their own pictures and photos. I mean, how many people in this room have a proper solid backup of all the pictures and all the things that they hold dear to them? Um, on their phone. And if people can't even back up a few pictures, how do we expect them to keep a private key? And that's why we need to look at other areas where we can help people with that kind of thing in order to prevent the massive loss of those assets. And that's both a technological um, issue and all sorts of other ways in which we can lose them. Can I make a quick comment, which is that I worked for about a decade with the World Web Consortium, Tim Berners-Lee, who gave us the web, which is currently being centralized, and the Internet Engineering Task Force, which gave us such things as TCP IP and TLS and the sort of backbone of the internet. And all of these innovations, the original internet, the original web, uh, were not ran by regulators. Uh, they were self-regulated by open, multi-stakeholder standards bodies. If it worked for the original web and the internet, I believe it will probably work out for cryptocurrency. In general, I think it should be very suspicious of regulation, particularly premature optimization via regulation, because the entire point of cryptocurrencies is to bring human freedom, financial freedom, to people. And in general, regulation does, by its very nature, restrict freedom. So Harry, for your current project NIC and your previous projects, um, I believe it's uh, Nick Sleep and Panoramics. Is this something that you were having to contend with relating to regulations? Uh, we generally are trying to build software which is compliant with regulations such as the General Data Protection Regulation. But as we all know, these kinds of European privacy regulations mostly just have you fill out stupid forms, they click on emails, and they more or less waste your time, and they do very little for privacy. So we're trying to convince the European Commission and other parts of uh, other countries that rather than waste their time building ridiculous privacy regulation, which doesn't really work and can't actually help users, to actually use decentralized and privacy enhancing technologies such as mixed networks or, for example, next generation protocols, such as the IETF message layer security protocol. 
Thanks. So, so Jeremy, um, yeah, sir, you yeah, can just say that uh, uh, let's not speak about regulation now. We should uh, better concentrate on education because still so many people, they are using the same passwords everywhere, they uh, don't have any measures how to, you know, they don't know, they, they don't have uh, someone to like uh, uh, block him from using this password and they're just very lazy, so uh, I think uh, regulation is second, first is education. So Dimitri, um, Dimitri, you're also the CEO and co-founder of cybersecurity consultant company called Hacker, yeah. um, which is crowdsourced security platform for white hat hackers, hack and proof, and crypto exchanges and analytical platform CER, CryptoExchangeRanks.com. And you're an expert in cybersecurity and digital assets audit. And is also a member of ACCA and X Deloitte Top Manager. So um, it would be also a good thing to actually check with you on what are some of the best practices moving on from that that you have observed in the industry. For example, what are some of the measures to prevent hacks as an end user or the exchanges? So uh, first I want to ask, uh, there is two layers. There is a layer of a personal, uh, of a person, uh, how to be protected. And second is, so for example, exchange, how to protect users uh, from. So uh, first of all, I want to uh, ask the question to raise your hands. Who was, has ever been hacked? Mm. Do we have such people? What was the question? Uh, have you ever been hacked? Anyone been hacked? Well, most people have been hacked without knowing it. Okay, okay. So, so I mean, like, if uh, you didn't raise your hand, probably you're not so important. Because uh, everybody can be hacked. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, it's all about the matter of uh, costs and uh, what you can get from it. Because uh, uh, we are living in digital world. We don't have a traffic player, we don't have person, uh, uh, personal layer where we can fish. We can, hackers can go and fish your wife, for example, when she is, uh, and go into your network. So it's like a lot of uh, things that you can do. But of course, uh, the key is to uh, educate yourself all the time and to use all available tools. Uh, you will never be protected on 100%, but you can reach a pretty good percentage, like 99 So, for a personal security, I would say never use the same password. I know it's uh, uh, very difficult, uh, we are all very lazy people, but yes, just try to uh, use your cybersecurity hygiene, like uh, write it down, for example, I'm writing down my passwords, I use password managers that I trust, and this is how I, 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 I work. Uh, second thing is that uh, always use two-factor, but never link uh, your two-factor and to your mobile phone. Uh, no, because there is a very big risk for SIM swap or just a, a simple uh, uh, steal of your phone. Yeah, if I steal your phone, I can immediately take out the SIM card and uh, knowing your emails, I will just reset all the passwords. So uh, be careful with this uh, as well. And uh, the third thing is, uh, and, and, and then I would like to speak about uh, uh, exchange uh, uh, exchanges. So uh, we recently made uh, a research and we identified that out of 100 top uh, crypto exchanges, only 83, uh, only, uh, sorry, 16% uh, has their bug bounty program. So it means that uh, if the hacker or like any other user identifies a bug, uh, he can submit it and uh, to receive reward. What does it mean? It means that the rest, 83%, they don't announce bug bounty because they know they have a lot of problems and they don't want to uh, get people's attention. So yes, we are in, uh, in the industry that is very immature and uh, the level of cybersecurity uh, of most of the exchanges is pretty bad. Uh, but uh, so what I uh, propose to everyone is that you have to uh, uh, select exchanges who has bug bounty. Why? Because hackers are also lazy. They are lazy people like us. Sometimes even more lazy. And if they see that the exchange is taking care of the security by opening the bug bounty, they understand that probably White Hats already went there and checked uh, for all the bugs in order to get more money, or to get the money. So they will probably go to some other exchanges because really, like, uh, most of the exchanges are founded not by technical guys, but 
by finance guys and PR guys and marketing guys and they really care more about speed and marketing rather than security. So just pay attention to bug bounty. So based on experience, based on the hacks that you've seen so far, uh, what percentage of it will you attribute it to insider threats? Insider hacks? In insider hacks? Oh, um, uh, this is uh, this is interesting, unexpected question. <laughs> but uh, I would say that uh, uh, if you look at the picture of uh, cryptocurrency hacks, uh, I would say that more than half is inside. It's rather uh, it's rather uh, you are trying to intentionally say, "Oh my God, I was hacked," but you just like uh, spend uh, the money of traders. Or yes, it was some uh, insider like conflict uh, between in the company. So I would say it's more than half. Uh, uh, just, um, yeah, I mean, like, obviously I agree with your advice. Um, the problem is with giving people security advice if they don't take it. Um, and uh, we can we can sit here from now until the end of time, and possibly even longer, telling people to use secure passwords, um, to use two-factor fact authentication, to do it properly. Uh, and they still won't. Uh, and one of the issues about these passwords just generates a security mechanism, just don't work. Uh, and, and, and as people involved in technology, uh, we need to find better ways of doing it where it's not so much effort um, for, for, for people. Uh, and I guess that would be one of my worries about um, continued advice because it, it's, it's never worked. Um, we've been talking about passwords now for what, 20 years? Um, and telling people to secure them and not use the same one. Um, and, and, yeah. Yeah, passwords were invented as a, a temporary hack. I think uh, the multi system in the 1960s or 70s at MIT, they were never meant to be a long term way to deal with security of user accounts. So we also have 30 years of research into cryptographic credentials for users and what's called capabilities based systems. Uh, while there's been tons of people making stupid coins and weird ICOs and tokens, I think it probably would be very worthwhile uh, for the community to investigate the proper usage of credentials. So we're looking at anonymous authentication credentials, and NIM, I would hope that other people, we have tons of research there that has not been applied to space, and I hope uh, entrepreneurs go out and look at that research and start applying it to the space. So Jeremy, you are also the product lead at Umese Go, and you're responsible for product strategy and coordination of product delivery. Um, can you share a bit about any best practices as well that um, you have seen your organization implement? Uh, yeah, sure, of course. Um, I think it starts with the knowledge that hiding the information isn't, necessary, isn't really the best way forward. So, um, being open about the processes um, allows people to be able to audit internally and also be able to understand. Just because you understand how a process works doesn't necessarily mean that you can um, actually go about it and, and, and exploit that process. Um, the other thing that you know, we'll be looking to implement when we do go live is to implement bug bounties, to engage the community where there's a wider, large, uh, a wider range of eyes that can look 